Please rise as you are able to join me in the call to worship. A voice speaks to us in our dreams, beckoning, warning. In the night, our minds wrestle with worries and hopes. In the brightness of morning, we gather in worship to seek a word from God. And please remain standing for our opening hymn. reading is from 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 8 to 13. Love never ends, but as for prophecies, they will come to an end. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will come to an end. For we know only in part, and we prophesy only in part. But when the complete comes, the partial will come to an end. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child and reasoned like a child. When I became an adult, I put an end to childish ways. For now we see in a mirror, dimly, but then we will see face to face. Now I know only in part, then I will know fully, even as I have been fully known. And now faith, hope, and love abide. Of these three, and the greatest of these, is love. May God bless the hearing and understanding of these words. 
The selection I will be singing today is called Bosoi. It's in French and it's by Claude Debussy. The text describes um, a beautiful evening where there's a setting sun, there's that warm breeze and just that bliss of life is beautiful. We get to experience this that the creator made for us. And the sentiment of the song is that we want to embrace that beauty for as long as we can. Let's pray. Lord, we gather here to open our hearts, not to my words, but to yours. And so I ask today that you would speak to each one of us the word that you would have us hear. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. For you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Last week, as Patricia said, I started a series, a sermon series, on the idea of discernment, which is a word in Christian spirituality describing the process of seeking God's guidance for our lives. Now, in some ways, this is one of Christianity's most basic ideas, kind of the, the notion of discernment, the belief that God is active in the world and in our lives, that God seeks loving relationship with us, and that as part of that relationship, God offers us guidance through what's often called the Holy Spirit. So the idea is simple, but putting it into practice is complicated and difficult. I've learned a lot from the writings and the teaching of a man named Glenn Hinson. Hinson is a pastor and a seminary professor who's written extensively on prayer and on discernment. And once in this talk that I heard him give, Hinson said, God does not drive a bulldozer. God is not going to come plowing in and knock down your house to get your attention. That's not the way discernment works. God's spirit is much gentler and more subtle than that. There's another writer and teacher whose work I love. Her name is Cynthia Bourgeau. She's been very valuable to me. And, and Cynthia says, remember that the non-essential will always intrude. 
God will always wait to be invited. The non-essential will always intrude. God will always wait to be invited. So in large part, I think the process of discernment is the process of learning to quiet all of those other voices that are yelling at us in our culture so that we can hear the still, small, subtle, gentle, loving voice of God. Last week, I talked about our anxiety-fueled culture and the way that anxiety and fear can prevent us from hearing God. Because here's the thing, God is always, God is always fully and lovingly present to us in every moment of our lives. There is not a single instant that God ignores any of us or turns away from us or is even distracted from us. But it's really easy, at least for me, to be distracted from God, especially when I become anxious or afraid. So learning to quiet our anxiety helps us to pay attention to God. And then in turn, learning to pay attention to God helps us learn to quiet our anxiety. So it becomes this kind of virtuous circle where we become more attuned to God's movement in our lives. Now today, I want to raise another question that I think is absolutely related to discernment. What tells us when we're doing it right? How do we know we're on the right track? If we're trying to follow God, trying to be guided by the Spirit in our decision-making, how do we know when we're doing it? Now, some of you know that before our bishop appointed me to serve here at University Park United Methodist Church, I served at St. Andrew UMC, which is down in Highlands Ranch. It's just about eight miles south of here on University Boulevard. And just like we do here, just like happens here every week, several times a week, we used to get calls at St. Andrew from people who were in financial trouble asking us for help. So one afternoon, a few years back, I was sitting in my office at St. Andrew when the receptionist called from the front desk and said someone had come in asking to see a pastor. So I sat down at my desk, took a few deep breaths, kind of got my mind out of the stuff I was working on, and I said a brief prayer asking for God's compassion and wisdom and guidance as I tried to help this person. And then I walked out into the lobby where he was waiting for me. When I got there, I saw this tall man with very upright posture, maybe in his late 70s. He was wearing slacks and a neatly pressed shirt. His leather shoes were clean and shined. He was clean shaven with a full head of white hair combed straight back. Now, I really try to avoid stereotyping people, but I got to say, this guy did not look like most of the people we had coming in asking for assistance. So I invited him back to my office to sit down, and he was quiet for about 30 seconds or so. And finally, he said quietly, this is very, very difficult for me. This is very awkward. I've never had to ask for this kind of help before in my life. My wife and I have always been financially stable. Last year, though, she was diagnosed with lung cancer, and our insurance only covered part of the treatments and the care that she's needed. We have spent all of our life savings paying for the rest. I've still got a retirement check, and it comes in every month, and we own our house, so we're not going to be homeless, but She's on oxygen, and we are behind on the payments, and we are completely out of money until next week. Our son is flying in to help, but he won't be here for a few days yet. And frankly, I haven't told him how bad things are because I'm ashamed. I'm embarrassed to be in this position. We need to pay the oxygen company $350, or they won't deliver the tanks that my wife needs. And these tears began to well up in his eyes. And he said, I am so sorry to be asking this, but is there any way that the church can help pay for my wife's oxygen? Now, at this point, I was beginning to get a little teary myself. I was also angry because I've heard this kind of story over and over and over in the nonprofit work that I've done, and I find it infuriating that in the richest nation on earth, we have people in that situation, and we can't seem to figure out how to help them. So I said, look, we can cover this bill. It's fine. I've got a small discretionary fund that's intended for just things exactly like this. I can get a check cut right now so your wife can get her oxygen. I said, look, I, I don't mean to pry, but do you guys have any food in the house? I mean, do you need some groceries? He said, oh, we've got a few cans of vegetables. And he kept apologizing, saying how sorry he was to ask for help. I said, please, don't apologize. We've got the money. It's set aside. That's what it's for. Don't even worry about it. 
So I went down to the office, I got the check cut, I brought it back for him so he could get some groceries and some oxygen. And he thanked me and he told me that I was an incredible blessing to him and his family and he walked out the door. And I went back to my office that day feeling like if I had done nothing else, if I had done nothing else of value in all my staring at computer screens and trying to schedule meetings and everything else that went along with administration at St. Andrew, if I'd done nothing else, I had done at least one thing of value in the kingdom of heaven. So a few days later, I was talking with our congregational care pastor, a woman named Stacy Collins. Maybe some of you have run into Stacy. Methodist world is small. But anyway, she's, she's great. And, and so I said to Stacy, hey, I just wanted to let you know, I used some money from the care fund the other day to help somebody who had some medical expenses and, and was in a bad situation. And I told her about the guy who came in, about his wife's cancer, how she needed oxygen, and they were short until his retirement check arrived. And Stacy said, wait, Tall guy, well-dressed, white hair? I said, yeah. She said, you gotta be kidding me. That same guy came in here a few weeks ago. He told me exactly the same story, right down to how his son would be here in a few days and he only had a few cans of vegetables in the house and he needed to pay the oxygen company 350 bucks and he was so sorry because he never asked anybody for help. Same guy, same story. Now, do you remember that old movie, it's maybe 30 years old, I don't know, called The Usual Suspects? Anybody see that, remember it? So it's a kind of a noir mystery kind of thing. And there's this moment at the very end of the film when the detective who's been pursuing a global criminal mastermind suddenly realizes that the criminal he's been after for the whole movie has completely deceived and defeated him in every way. And you see this close-up of the detective's shocked face and the camera pans out a little bit and the coffee cup that he's holding slips out of his hand in slow motion and bounces and shatters on the floor. Remember that scene? That was me. <laughs> that was like exactly how I felt at that moment as it suddenly hit me that this tall, dignified gentleman with Oscar-worthy acting skills had brazenly walked into the church and beat us out of 500 bucks not once but twice in less than a month. Now, at first, I was mad, right? I was angry. I mean, the congregation entrusted this money to us so we could help people in need, not so we could get burned by con men. But at the same time, I got to say, there was a little part of me that was kind of impressed, you know? I, I've been doing this a long time. I don't get beat out of money very often. And I got to hand it to the guy. He was good, right down to the, like, the tears welling up in his eyes and everything. Now, my admiration for him did not keep Stacy and me from creating some new processes, safeguards. So as far as I know, it didn't happen again. But then I guess if somebody was really good, I wouldn't know, would I? But over the past few weeks, as I've been thinking about this sermon series, I've been wondering, what would we say about that whole episode from the perspective of discernment? I mean, there we are, right? Stacy and me both trained professional clergy, don't try this at home, both praying like before we talk to people, praying for discernment, praying for God's will, and both getting conned. What did we do wrong? Well, the obvious answer is that we allowed our emotions and our empathy and frankly our stereotyping to get the better of us. We should have checked his story. Should have told him that we could only pay his oxygen company directly. Told him that we could give him a grocery card instead of cash. And maybe that would have helped. But maybe there's another answer to this question, one that's less about procedure and more about the process of discernment itself. This passage that we heard Pat read a few minutes ago from the book of 1 Corinthians is pretty well known because it's often read at weddings. We left out the traditional wedding part today, but you've probably heard it. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. I officiated my first wedding maybe 30 years ago, and I have long since lost count of the number of times that I have read 1 Corinthians 13 at weddings. But the funny thing is, as apt and suitable and beautiful as it is, that passage is not about romantic love at all. It has absolutely nothing to do with weddings. In his letter to the church at Corinth, Paul is addressing a congregation that has fallen completely into conflict. They're treating each other badly. Their conversations have degenerated into fights. Many of them can't stand to be in the same room together. They're not talking, or if they are, it's not talking so much as yelling. 
They're fighting about doctrine. They're fighting about who should lead the church. They're fighting about what it means to be the church and how to worship and who to include. They're fighting about how to relate to the broader non-Christian community around them. Ultimately, what they're fighting about, what they're fighting about is a whole set of issues that have to do with discernment. These questions of how God is calling them to live. Now, Paul takes on, in the letter to the church at Corinth, Paul takes on a lot of these questions just sort of one by one. And in the process, he kind of sketches in a Christian way of life that is very different than what's around them in the cosmopolitan, religiously diverse city of Corinth. But then, in the 13th chapter, Paul gets right to the heart of what's going on. He's writing about how the Corinthian Christians are called to live, even though they haven't settled all these big questions, even though for some of them, there probably is no way to settle them once and for all. In a sense, Paul is writing about the conditions under which every one of us live, and that is that our information, our knowledge is always incomplete. We never know anything fully. We never know everything about anything. Those are just the conditions under which we live. Paul puts it kind of like this. He says, there will come a day when creation is completed, when it is brought by God to its ultimate fulfillment. And on that day, when we come face to face with God, then we will know and see in ways we cannot even imagine. But now, he says, now we see as in a mirror, dimly. Or you can translate the Greek as, we see as in a riddle, dimly. The Greek word that's being translated there is enigmati. It's where we get our words enigma or enigmatic. If you were translating that passage loosely, you might say Paul is saying something like, in this life, everything we see is an enigma. Everything we see is a puzzle, a riddle, at best, a dim reflection of the truth. But we have to live our lives anyway. We have to make decisions anyway. That's the way life works. I think Paul is reminding these angry Corinthian Christians locked in a battle over who is right, who has the truth. He's reminding them that their knowledge is at best incomplete. And it's true for us too. We see so little. We know so little about the effects of our actions or the profound mystery of our lives. But even though we can't see clearly, says Paul, we can act. Because faith and hope and love last forever. So when we are seeking to be guided by God, when we don't know what to do, when we are fearful and angry and anxious, even then we can choose to act in faith and hope that God is at work. We can choose to act in love, taking action in what we believe to be the best interests of the world around us, all of God's world. So what did Stacy and I do wrong? Procedurally, lots of things, right? But ultimately, maybe nothing. Maybe nothing. The Trappist monk and writer and teacher, Thomas Merton, once said that with God, a little sincerity goes a long way. If we act in love, if we strive to act so that we and those around us can become truly whole, we almost can't get it wrong. We don't know what the outcome of our choices will be. Sometimes things will go sideways on us. That's just life. What we do know is that when we act in faith and hope and love, God is at work in us and through us. And in the end, maybe that's enough. Maybe that's more than enough to aim for. Let me invite you into a few moments of silence. Let's pray together. Creator God, in a world of so much heaviness, so much that could lead us to despair, so much that might lead us to feel hopeless, we ask that you will grant us the strength and the courage that comes from your love, that you would inspire in us the wisdom and the vision that comes from faith and hope, for as scripture reminds us, these are the things that last forever. Lead us to serve all your people, and all your creation as we receive your extraordinary gift, a role in the kingdom of heaven that even now takes shape among us. 
You've heard the prayers that we speak aloud, and you hear those that we lift silently in our hearts before you. Especially this morning, we are mindful of the people of Ukraine and in other regions throughout the world facing the brutality of war. We ask that the spirit of your peace and your reconciliation might be there and that you might grant the people facing such horrific reality peace and courage that they will need in the next months and perhaps even years. We ask that you would be with those who we have lifted here today, that you would be with Rick's brother as he continues to wrestle with his illness, that you would be with Michael and Liz's family as they seek to gather around Joan and John and comfort them in this very difficult hour. We ask that you would be with Joanne's niece, Laura, who was hit by a car while bicycling home, that she is recovering at home. We ask that you would speed her recovery, that you would deliver her from pain, that you would grant her peace and patience that she will need to make the full recovery, the healing to which you call all of us. We ask that you would bless Joanne's mother, Rose, who is now undergoing cancer treatment. We are mindful of her, of Renee, of John, of all those who are part of this congregation and have been for so many years. We ask that your love and your peace would surround them and would surround Rose, that she might know your presence, that she might know your strength in these very difficult and often frightening moments. And we give you thanks, Lord. We give you thanks for the life of Dorothy Ann Peeper and the way that she was an example to so many, the way that your light shone through her. We give you thanks for the upcoming marriage of the Neal's granddaughter, Bethany, as she has recently been engaged. These signs of hope are all around us, if only we can remember to look. And so we offer you thanks and praise for all of them. And we offer all these prayers in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray by saying, Our Creator, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Please rise as you're able, and let's join in our final hymn. The words will be on the screen. This week and in every week to come, may faith and hope and love be yours. 
And may they light the way before you, even when around you all seems dark and confusing. Know that faith and hope and love last forever. Go in peace.